Good day to one and all, and welcome to the 40th installment of Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History. So, lately we've been covering Rome's religious landscape, getting into some mythology, rituals, gods, and goddesses. Today, what I'm going to do is talk about Carthage as a sort of preface to the Punic Wars. But before we talk about Carthage, we need to go way back in time and talk about the Phoenicians some more. If you're wondering where the word Punic and Phoenician come from, uh, it's from a Greek word for purple, and that is specifically the Tyrian purple extracted from crushed shells of the Murex mollusk, uh, which washed up in abundance on the coast of Phoenician lands. The Akkadian word for purple-colored wool had been kinahu, whence came the word Canaanite. And once the Greeks arrived on the scene, uh, they thought of the locals as the uh, purple people as well. So they called them the Phoenikes, the purple people. This rare purple would become the official color of the Roman emperor, and anyone found dying even a tablecloth from it could be brought to execution for pretense to emperorship. This purple was eventually featured on the toga, and while it was punishable to have affectations of higher class, uh, the classes to which the purple applied was quite broad in the Republican period. Uh, any freeborn boys could wear the striped toga praetexta uh, with purple stripes. But that was a long ways away from where we are now. In fact, here's a good point to talk about exonyms in antiquity and how we are rarely, uh, outside of the Greeks and the Romans, given the ancient people's perspectives. Our word for non-Greek people here is a Greek word. So I just wanted to point out how common this phenomenon is and how we shouldn't take for granted that these names held any meaning for the cultures to which they were mapped over. So we need to go back, uh, way back, to 1500 BC, and zoom in our focus toward the central Levant. The Phoenicians were an ancient Semitic phallusocracy, and they were centered on the Mediterranean coastal part of the Fertile Crescent. This uh, was along the coastline of modern-day Lebanon, uh, Israel-Palestine, Jordan, Gaza, Syria, and southwest Turkey. Along with the Minoans and the nebulous Sea Peoples, the Phoenicians were best known as seafaring entrepreneurs, traders, and raiders who hunted, exploited, and made use of the ancient Mediterranean and its resources during the Bronze and Early Iron Ages. Throughout human history, however, commerce and piracy have been so closely related that people who acted as pirates uh, on one trade lane or coast would act as merchants elsewhere. So we shouldn't view piracy and trade as necessarily two distinct careers. Nevertheless, it, it was well before the Greeks began their own colonization process that the Phoenicians were sending out colonies to dot the Western Mediterranean and even the Atlantic. The most famous of these was the city-state of Carthage, which was planted on the coast of North Africa in modern-day Tunisia uh, around the year 814 BC, uh, which would declare its independence in 650 BC. Virgil's Aeneid uh, tacitly places Dido a few centuries earlier, uh, contemporaneous to the fall of Troy, and such as poetic license at its finest. Now, when we use the word Phoenician, we have to realize that this shouldn't suggest to us that they were in any way a kind of unified race or nation with shared goals. These were competing city-states. They had a shared culture, but it was widely subject to local variability, much in the same way the Greeks were. And that's something I've been trying to drive home in this series. Uh, 
the non-static element of civilizations in Egypt, in the Levant, in the Aegean, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's like an ever-changing kaleidoscopic array of states and cultures, not a few timeless, unchanging monolithic blocks. And, and this is actually what distinguishes history from anthropology, uh, that additional vector of, of plotting change over time. Now, let's not convince ourselves that the world is smaller than it actually is either, uh, despite how it might feel today in the wake of globalism. The Mediterranean is the largest inland sea in the world, covering an area of 2.5 million square kilometers. So stretching one people over that whole distance is a real, you know, feat of civilization. The Mediterranean would have had roughly the shape it had today, 5 million years ago, uh, when the Atlantic flooded the land barrier at Gibraltar between modern-day Spain and Morocco. And from there, the water level swelled gradually in phases, with the advancing and retreating of glaciers, wiping out and relocating littoral settlements, uh, once humans actually started building permanent habitations, probably from around 200,000 BP onwards. Uh, once we can safely say that humanity reached the brain size that it has now. So, the most notable of all the Phoenician city-states were Tyre, Sidon, Arwad, Berytus, and Carthage. Each a politically independent unit. Now, this is normal because with the dispersal of people often comes the dispersal of authority. In terms of the archaeology, the linguistics, the culture, and the religion, there's really nothing setting the Phoenicians apart from other Semitic Canaanites, uh, which means they were directly linked in ancestry to the people who would distinguish themselves as a separate cultural entity altogether, the Hebrews. They were Canaanites too. Canaanites' fame, or perhaps it would be more apt to say their notoriety, was well-rooted in such, you know, well-known documentary sources such as the contemporary hieroglyphic and cuneiform records, or in the later Hebrew Bible and classical Greek literature. In fact, the Phoenicians were actually the first people to make use of an alphabet instead of hieroglyphs or cuneiform, and this is where the Hebrews and the Greeks, and then subsequently the Romans, would derive their own alphabets. How, specifically, is another question entirely. Now, this Canaanite culture allegedly evolved out of an earlier Gasulian, Chalcolithic culture, with itself developed from the Kirkham Arabian nomadic pastoral complex, which in turn had evolved out of a fusion of ancestral Natufian and Harifian cultures with pre-pottery Neolithic bee farming cultures. These folks had taken up animal domestication during the 6200 BC climactic crisis which triggered the Neolithic Revolution in the Levant. So if you want to go way back, this is where these people come from. As is generally the case, linguistically speaking, the boundaries between language and dialect are especially foggy in the Semitic language family. The biggest difficulty here is what's called the aerial effects, and those are due to the scarcity of evidence. Um, it's hard to determine what was inherited from the proto-familial and what was borrowed from their cousins next door. So, for example, if we were only handed a few Roman, Italian, and French inscriptions, a wealth of Spanish literature, and nothing else, we would have tremendous difficulty determining the exact relationship of all these fragments, though a connection would be obvious. Nonetheless, uh, we can at least establish that there have existed the following language groups within Semitic, and here's a catalog of all of them, most of which only survive in small inscriptions. So East Semitic includes Akkadian, and this was spoken in Mesopotamia, 
uh, from about 2500 BC to the first century BC. We have Eblite, so we have texts from Ebla, uh, Tel Mardik in northern Syria, and this only dates from 2400 to 2300 BC. We have South Semitic, and that includes modern South Arabian and Ethiopian Semitic. Central Semitic includes Old South Arabian, or Epigraphic South Arabian, uh, from the 8th century BC to the 6th century AD. Arabic includes North Arabian pre-Islamic inscriptions from the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD in different scripts. Pre-classical Arabic from the 2nd century BC to the 3rd century AD. And then classical Arabic, which is the language of the Quran, uh, modern literary Arabic, and then modern Arabic dialects. These all come from the broader Arabic family. The Northwest Semitic languages include uh, Amorite, which was the language of the once semi-nomadic people attested in personal names from the second millennium BC. We have Ugaritic, the language of the texts from Ugarit in Syria, and these are from the second millennium BC. Next, there's Aramaic, which includes Old, Imperial, Achaemenid, and Biblical Aramaic, uh, Palestinian Aramaic, Nabataean, Talmudic Ar Aramaic, Syriac, Classical and Modern, Mandaic, and Modern Aramaic, uh, Neo-Aramaic dialects and languages. And lastly, and most importantly for our purposes, we have Canaanite, which includes Moabite, 9th century BC, Ammonite, Edomite, Phoenician and Punic, and of course, Hebrew. Now, the great Annals historian, Fernand Braudel, whose work, uh, The Mediterranean and the Mediterranean World, I've had the misfortune of being forced to read in the span of a single week, he claimed that uh, Phoenicia was an early example of a world economy surrounded by empires. Phoenicians were typically thought of as mediators, travelers, merchants, always uh, expanding with new business opportunities abroad and then bringing the wealth back home. In fact, a great example of this is uh, a unique concentration in Phoenician silver hoards dating uh, between 1200 and 800 BC and these contain hack silver with lead isotope ratios that match those from ores in Sardinia and Spain, uh, exactly where their colonies were situated. Now, this league of independent port city-states along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea were ideally suited for trade between the Levant area and the rest of the ancient world. Around 1200 BC, however, uh, we get the Bronze Age collapse, and in the resulting power vacuum left by a crumbled Hittite and a severely diminished Egyptian world, uh, a number of these Phoenician cities arose as significant actors on the stage for world power. We, we could argue that the Phoenicians are responsible for keeping the ball of civilization rolling throughout the so-called Dark Ages, which obviously weren't so dark for them. Uh, this was actually a golden age for them. The development of the Phoenician alphabet out of Proto-Canaanite happened during the 11th century BC, and then by the time the quote-unquote lights came back on in the 7th century BC, Carthage could boast a population of 300,000, many of whom lived in huge six- or seven-story limestone apartment buildings fully furnished with plumbing. By the 6th century BC, the Carthaginian explorer Hanno the Navigator was busy mapping out the western coast of Africa, founding and repopulating colonies along his way past Morocco. Uh, this guy got his own crater on the moon named after him. Now, skip ahead a couple centuries and, and what do we have? Well. As Carthage was rising to great prominence in the Western Mediterranean, their mother culture was fading out. They 
dominate as a sea power in the West, unchecked for uh, two and a half centuries, until ultimately we see the Achaemenid Persians rising up to the East, Cyrus the Great conquers Phoenicia in 539 BC, uh, they break up Phoenicia in four vassal states, Sidon, Tyre, Arwad, and Byblos, and uh, it's the Phoenicians who would eventually supply Persia its fleets for the invasions of Greece. Uh, the Persians weren't exactly maritime people after all. Uh, they were chiefly light infantry skirmishers specialized in rough terrain. But once the Phoenicians were subdued and absorbed into the Persian Empire, we could safely say Phoenician influence was in decline. And then by the end of the Punic Wars, their civilization was fading from existence. Alexander the Great took Tyre in 332 BC after a siege. The fact that they didn't just surrender when his armies showed up and uh, they forced him to hold the siege made Alexander treat Tyre extremely harshly, uh, executing 2,000 of their local ruling elites, all while maintaining the king in power as a puppet. The other cities in the Levant he took peacefully, and uh, from then on, Greeks and Macedonians gradually ousted the remnants of Phoenicia's former dominance over Eastern Mediterranean trade. Phoenician culture virtually disappeared entirely from its motherland. Uh, its religion and culture was syncretized, transformed, and assimilated. Aramaic survived at the local level, of course, but uh, the elite stratum of society all but disappeared. They spoke Greek now. Nevertheless, uh, Carthage continued to flourish in North Africa, on some western Mediterranean islands, and in Iberia. For much of its history after achieving its independence, the colony of Carthage would be on hostile terms with the Greeks of Sicily, uh, leading to a series of armed conflicts known as the Greek-Punic Wars, uh, circa 600 to 265 BC, whose events would eventually trigger the Punic Wars with Rome. 264 to 146 BC. In 146 BC, the Roman forces destroyed, relocated, then occupied the city of Carthage, causing nearly all of the other Phoenician city-states and former Carthaginian dependencies to the west to fall into Roman hands. It should be noted that Carthage also had the added disadvantage, though sometimes advantage, of having to deal with the Berber tribes indigenous to the area where Carthage was built. Uh, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. Most of the local area outside of Carthage had fallen to the Romans some half a century earlier. Many other parts of the empire were meanwhile absorbed by the Numidian rulers, especially Massinissa, while Carthage was treaty-bound from protecting itself in the interbellum period. Now, like their Hebrew cousins, the Phoenicians were known for being very religious. Uh, the problem is that to the Western mind, their beliefs dwell in uncanny valley. And this is on account of their similarity to the ancient Israelite religion. Not only that, but because we have such a wealth of literature from the people who wanted to distinguish themselves from being Canaanite, what we have is that these people are thoroughly vilified and demonized in popular imagination. In particular, uh, temple prostitution and child sacrifice are the most often cited examples of their immoral heathen depravity. Uh, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail because others have written whole books on the subject, which I'm not going to summarize here, but I can tell you this much. The, the child sacrifice thing is largely Hebrew propaganda, especially in Jeremiah and 2 Kings, and much later Roman propaganda too, which uh, really loved to vilify the Carthaginians as well. It may or may not have happened, but largely its role in religion tends to be overrepresented in the accounts of enemies. Now, there 
is some material evidence of what could be human sacrifice, uh, but it's just as likely that the remains recovered were of children who had died of other causes before they were thrown in the fire. We have something like this in Athens as well, uh, where a bunch of babies and dogs were being thrown down a well. Well, it turns out these were offerings to Hecate, and they were made up of already dead infants. In any case, uh, in regard to temple prostitution, we're not talking about literal sexual encounters. Uh, we're talking about women selected to be married in a quote-unquote sacred marriage uh, fertility ritual. These were not people who hung around temples offering sexual services to honor the goddess. I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. In Canaan, the supreme god was called El. Uh, the plural is Elohim. This is the plural of respect, sort of like the royal we in English. Uh, El simply means God in common Semitic, and uh, this is the same El you get in common theophoric names like Michael, Daniel, Ezekiel, etc. Uh, it's even cognate with the word Allah. Al ah. Remember, Israel means he who wrestles with El, as in Jacob. The Canaanites, you could say, were very secretive with their beliefs. Their storm god was Baal, meaning master, or Melkart, meaning king of the city, or Adonis, meaning lord. Now, it's quite possible that these were merely cover names, in the same way that Adonai, Lord, was a cover name for the sacred and unutterable four-syllable name of yod He vav He. They might have used these kinds of nondescript titles as covers for the secluded names which were known only to a select few initiated priests. The fact is, we'll never know, because if it's true, there won't be any inscriptions of the name making the idea unfalsifiable, and it really depends on whether the name became a cover name before the advent of literacy, or if there's some great blasphemous graffiti to be found. Uh, the truth may or may not be out there. Otherwise, uh, being full-blown polytheists, the Semitic pantheon was well-stocked with all manner of local and tribal variants. It should go without saying, almost, that uh, Canaanite religion was strongly influenced by their more powerful and populous neighbors, uh, the Hittites, the Mesopotamians, and the Egyptians. In discussing Canaanite religion, we have this problem where we have a wealth of information from outsiders, such as the Hebrew Bible or the Hellenistic Philo of Byblos, who claimed Tautos, the Egyptian Thoth, as his chief source, so there's the link with Hermeticism, if anything. But from the inside, we have little left but inscriptions of divine names, clients, and practices. So, if the following descriptions seem scant, it's because we are generally limited by the ravages of death, time, erosion, and centuries of Christian and Islamic iconoclasm. So, from among their gods, we have Melkart, who ruled over Tyre, much in the same way that Marduk ruled over Babylon. The goddess Astarte, uh, Hebrew Astoreth, or Babylonian Ishtar, or Akkadian Inanna, was of particularly great importance, being the local manifestation of that great goddess archetype we discussed in the last lecture. Uh, you can look up the Syrian goddess, who also had her own set of transsexual eunuch priests. And uh, there was a great deal of consistency in this figure, going all the way back to Gilgamesh, as a goddess of sex and death simultaneously. Now, just like Kabili had her Attis, Demeter had her Persephone, uh, Ishtar had her Tammuz, Aphrodite had her Adonis, and Isis had her Osiris, well... Astarte had her Eshmun. Now, 
These pairs aren't standardized, uh, they're often interchangeable even, but they're commonly known and they are mythical depictions of cycles of nature, which are perennially dying and rising again. Some young lesser god, uh, goddess, or mythical human becomes the beloved of the great goddess. Um, that individual dies or goes down into the underworld, and the goddess weeps or mourns and goes to fetch them and bring them back uh, among the world of the living. So if you remember Gilgamesh denying the sexual advances of Ishtar, this is why. Be because all of her lovers end up dying. <laughs> now, there are an infinite number of permutations to this general archetype, and these are usually pertinent to the cultures that created them. But by and large, the whole cyclical dance of the cosmos is mapped out as a sacred drama between a set of god actors. These are the kinds of myths which would be imparted and reenacted in the mystery cults of antiquity. This is where the whole sacred prostitution thing comes into play. It's a person who takes on the role of one of these gods in a ritual, which sure might involve sex, drugs, and blood sacrifices, like a lot of uh, religious rituals did back then, but they didn't involve the commercialization of sex in temples, as the name would suggest. Sacred prostitutes were drawn from among upper-class elite women. They were venerated as divine vessels. They were not slaves to be degraded or to keep coffers full. This ideal grew out of that whole, quote, the nations are immoral discourse. And what could be more immoral from their perspective than having sex for money in a house of God? Anyhow, other gods include, and these are alphabetically ordered, not listed in terms of importance, um, there is Atar, the god of the morning star, uh, who tried to take the place of the dead Baal and failed. There is Baalat, or Baalit, and this was the wife or female counterpart of the storm god Baal. Uh, confer this with uh, Alat being the wife of El. Baal Hamun was a fertility god in the western colonies. Dagon, who was a Philistine fish god, uh, became a god of crop fertility and grain. This god shows up in the Bible during the time of King Saul. It's worth noting here that Poseidon took the opposite course historically, starting out as an earth deity. His name is Potis plus De, so master of earth or, you know, god of earth, and then taking on a maritime significance by the literate period. Now there was Ishat, the goddess of fire, uh, Kothara, the goddess of marriage and pregnancy, Kothar Wakasis, the god of craftsmanship, uh, Lotan, the twisting seven-headed serpent, this, this guy would find himself again in a position of prominency among 20th century Luciferian chaos magicians, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, we've got Markot, the god of dance, Mot or Mawat, who's the god of death and was not worshipped or given any offerings. There's uh, Nikalwaib, the goddess of orchards and fruit. Uh, Resef, the god of plague and of healing, sort of like the Greek Apollo or the Sumerian Pazuzu. And the list goes on, but I'll stop there. You get the idea. The Bible, for obvious reasons, is full of stuff about Phoenicians, and in fact the very word Biblia, which is the Greek word for books, came from the Greek word Biblos, which means papyrus, and this is what the Greeks named the city which the Phoenicians called Gebal, or Geval in Hebrew, after the papyrus that it produced. King Hiram, or Huron of Tyre, uh, is associated with the building of Solomon's first temple, which indeed, if it actually existed, had all the trappings of a Phoenician temple, as it's described in the Bible. From about the 17th century onward, this Phoenician king was enshrined in symbolic lore 
as the grand architect of the Masonic Temple, Hiram Abiff. First Kings 5.1 says, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the place of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. Second Chronicles 2.14 says, The son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold, silver, brass, iron, stone, timber, royal purple, blue, and in crimson, and fine linens, also to grave any manner of graving, and to find out every device which shall be put to him. So, we see that the people of Israel, for some time, were pretty tight with the Phoenicians, but obviously this, uh, quote, caused them to sin, or led them into error, or something along those lines, as they began to intermarry. This led to a crisis in identity, the rejection of polytheism for henotheism, and later of henotheism for monotheism, and then by the time of the prophets, some harangued against the practice of drawing royal wives from among foreigners. A good example of this, of course, is Elijah, who despised Jezebel, the princess of Tyre and consort of King Ahab, who introduced the worship of her god Baal. That's the Bell and Jezebel. Uh, the Book of Ruth is very much a response to this exclusivity where the ancestor of David is a foreigner. Uh, it's not so much that the Bible is inconsistent or clumsily contradicting itself here. Um, it's a very well thought out intergenerational debate playing out in scripture. Canaanite deities such as Baal were represented by figures or Ashra poles, which were placed in shrines, often on hilltops or so-called high places, surrounded by groves of trees. And we can explicitly see these being referred to in the Bible, in Hosea, uh, where they are outlawed. Now, we discussed most of this early on in the lecture series, but it's worth mentioning again here. History would be irrevocably changed forever on account of this one group of Canaanites' need for distinguishing itself from its Canaanite cousins. If it weren't for this uneasy, millennia-long process of cultural disassociation, we'd have no Judaism, no Christianity, and no Islam. The world would probably still be pagan, syncretic, and things would have unraveled very, very differently. But it's not for me to speculate what the world would be like otherwise. World history is kind of like a sailing ship on an aimless voyage, but even the slightest degree of change at the outset, over a long enough distance, can dramatically impact where you wind up at the end of your journey, and by end I mean the present moment. Now, Carthage's mythical founder, the legendary Dido, uh, aka Elissa, note the L, uh, was an exiled princess and widow of Acarbas, the high priest of Melkart in Tyre. Uh, this guy is named Sicaeus in the Aeneid. Uh, Dido's brother Pygmalion had killed her husband, and so she fled to escape his tyranny only to establish the city of Carthage. Along with her entourage, Dido took her gods with her for the trip. She was highly dedicated to the goddess Astarte, and so when she came to found Carthage, she brought along her priests and sacred prostitutes from Cyprus too. Uh, Astarte's consort, the agricultural fertility slash healing god Eshmun, was worshipped at Carthage as well. Melkart, being away from Tyre, was outshined by the emergent Be'el Hamun, which may mean uh, Lord of the Altars of Incense, though that's uncertain, and either way it's 
possibly just an epithet to cloak the real name. Eventually, the goddess Tanit would also supplant Astarte. Uh, she was probably a local Berber fertility goddess, and the two were syncretized from about the 6th century onwards to the point that Astarte's elements were being phased out in favor of Tanit's, which was more in line with the local sensibilities that spawned her. That being said, uh, the two goddesses maintained separate, albeit not entirely distinct, cults. Astarte was the planet Venus, and Tanit was the crescent moon. Uh, Astarte was sexually voracious, and Tanit was portrayed as chaste. The Greeks and Romans would call Astarte Venus Aphrodite, while Tanit they'd call Juno Hera, or Artemis. While the church father Tertullian, uh, a native of Carthage, writing during the 3rd century, compared Tanit to Ceres. Tanit gets conflated over the centuries with various other Canaanite goddesses too, um, each of which are the sister wives of El, and this category included the virgin war goddess Anat and the mother goddess Elat, who is incidentally the wife of Yahweh, um, Allah's ex-wife. But we've swept all that under the rug. Uh, now, this, this whole Tanit Juno thing would become an interesting piece of history of mimetic warfare between Carthage and Rome during the Punic Wars. Uh, whereas Rome had evoked Juno out from the neighboring city of Vei, the Juno of Carthage was to be placated. The word is ex orata. The Romans syncretized Tanit with Juno and then basically tried to turn her against the Carthaginians through ritual. Once Rome had conquered North Africa, uh, Tanit became Juno Caelestis in the inscription record, and she would become the dominant goddess in the region until the rise of Christianity. Now, with regards to the Berber or local Libyan religious beliefs, which permeated the area before Carthage got there, these were oriented by and large around the powers of animistic spirits and ancestor veneration, and so this was not eclipsed by the introduction of new gods like Baal Haman or Tanit, uh, rather the two systems snuggled up nicely with one another. This was common everyday syncretism at work. Religion on the ground level consisted of prayers, burning incense or fumigations, animal sacrifices, the pouring of libations, and, and the sort of thing we've seen elsewhere, the kind of rituals which would become the backbone of Western ceremonial magic. The temples and sacred sites were administered by a class of priests and priestesses. Uh, these conducted public ceremonies or feasts, and uh, also carried out funeral processes like embalming. It appears, as is generally the case, that the highest class of priests was closely associated with the royal family. Kings or surrogate kings may also have performed religious functions themselves. Now, much in the same way Rome had various colleges of priests, the Phoenicians had the same. Uh, there were religious institutions in Tyre called Marze. These were places of reunion. They were confraternities of sorts meant to foster social bonding and kin loyalty. They held banquets for their members on feast days, and uh, some of these developed into elite fraternities becoming very influential in the commercial trade and governance of Tyre. Sounds familiar? Of course it does. Later in Carthage, it's said the citizen body was divided into groups which met for common feasts, much in a similar fashion. Uh, it's even possible that these festival groups may have composed the basis of their voting system, whereby men were selected for membership of their assembly. At Carthage, officials were elected by assemblies, uh, but the highest offices could only be held by rich men, uh, since they would have been the only ones with the resources, the connections, and the leisure time to host and perform such kind of official functions. Now, I'm not telling you this to suggest there were uh, 
ancient Saturnine reptilian bloodlines who worship Baal and the Anunnaki in secret cabals, as seems fashionable to do these days. Uh, it's just to show the inextricable integration of religion, ritual, class power, and civic responsibility, which was characteristic of the ancient world. I've actually heard plenty of uh, stuff throughout my life about Canaanite or Phoenician and, by extent, Carthaginian religion, uh, especially coming out of right-wing Christian conspiracy dumb. And much of it isn't worth repeating here, but, but let's just say that their narrative makes for really entertaining science fiction. Uh, it's really all about taking the strong demonization element that's present in the Bible and driving it to its extreme into delusional levels of paranoia. Uh, this is one of the problems that emerges out of biblical literalism. You have to accept things like the children of God coming from outer space or other dimensions to impregnate women and create a race of giants. This, this exact stuff is paralleled in the Enochian tradition, which is allegorical literature about mystical experiences to be taken symbolically, not literally. So if you're going to entertain all that stuff, go ahead, but don't take it as historical record. Um, there's obviously no robust archaeological or literary evidence to prove the existence of Baal-worshipping, reptilian, half-breed Illuminati, satanic child sacrifice rings which live on today as some sort of world shadow government, or all the baggage that comes along with that narrative. That There's plenty of real problems in the world that deserve our attention, and we don't need to create grand narratives that span across all of history in order to scapegoat it onto a single family which in any case are fiction. This is just one of many examples in which one group of people's shit-talking and demonizing would actually reverberate across the globe for thousands of years. Now, I'd be misleading you if I were to say there wasn't a huge component of Canaanite or Phoenician religion in the occult, especially in things like cliffotic magic, which is a sort of inverted Kabbalah geared toward chaos and void. But these are from relatively modern reinterpretations of old gods and myths, not from the Phoenicians themselves. It's not like these occultists have secret Ugaritic books that the rest of us don't have access to, where you would find all this stuff laid out perfectly. Again, this comes from that adversarial nature which was construed out of the antagonism between Israel and its neighbors. All right, well, that about does it for now. Um, I'll finish up with a passage from the first book of Kings to give you an idea of the kind of identity politics propaganda that was written by the Hebrews against their neighbors. You know, there were lots to choose from, but I particularly like this story. Again, it's a kind of mimetic warfare at work. This is the kind of image which has spilled into popular imagination and uh, basically poisoned the well for research into the Phoenicians and later the Carthaginians for millennia to come. I'll throw some commentary in where I see fit, which I realize is changing an iota, but so be it. Uh, I should state before the outset that this whole type of scene is a popular trope in ancient literature. It's a thaumaturgical contest to see who's the better wizard, basically. You see it with Moses and Aaron versus the Egyptians, uh, with Apollonius of Tiana, with Simon Magus versus St. Peter, and so forth. So, here it is. So Ahab called all the Israelites and those prophets to Mount Carmel, which is a mountain range in northern Israel. Elijah, the prophet, approached the people and said, How long will you not decide between two choices? If the Lord is the true God, follow him. But if Baal is the true God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Notice this false dichotomy he offers. That, that, that false dichotomy would have meant nothing to a polytheist. Anyways, Elijah said, I am the only prophet of the Lord here, but there are 450 prophets of Baal. 
Bring two bulls. Let the prophets of Baal choose one bull and kill it and cut it into pieces. Then let them put the meat on the wood, but they are not to set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, putting the meat on the wood, but not setting fire to it too. You prophets of Baal, pray to your God, and I will pray to the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to this wood is the true God. All the people agreed that this was a good idea. Then uh, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, There are many of you, so you go first. Choose a bull and prepare it. Uh, pray to your God, but don't start the fire. So they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it. Uh, they prayed to Baal from morning until noon, shouting, Baal, answer us! Uh, but there was no sound and no one answered. They danced around the altar they had built. At noon, Elijah began to make fun of them. Uh, Pray louder, he said. If Baal is really a god, maybe he's thinking, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping, so you'll have to wake him. So you see, he's mocking the anthropomorphic character of the pagan gods. But this is acting as if El was not the same. You know, wrestling with Jacob and that sort of thing. The prophets prayed louder cutting themselves with swords and spears until their blood flowed, which was the way they worshipped. So here we have another example of this self-mutilation thing which I described as being common among the Gali of Kabili in the last lecture. Now, the afternoon passed and the prophets continued to act like this until it was time for the evening sacrifice, but no voice was heard. Baal did not answer and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Now come to me. So they gathered around him. And Elijah rebuilt the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. He took twelve stones, one stone for each of the twelve tribes, the number of Jacob's sons. Elijah used these stones to rebuild the altar in honor of the Lord. Then he dug a ditch around the altar that was big enough to hold about 13 quarts of seed. Elijah put the wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the meat and on the wood. So he's taunting them. Then Elijah said, do it again. And they did it again. Then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran off the altar and filled the ditch. At the time for the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah went near the altar. He said, Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Prove that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant. Show these people that you commanded me to do all these things. Lord, answer my prayer so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you will change their minds. Then the fire from the Lord came down and it burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the ground around the altar. It also dried up the water from the ditch. When all the people saw this, they fell down to the ground crying, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! Then Elijah said, Capture the prophets of Baal! Don't let any of them run away! And the people captured all the prophets, and Elijah led them down to the Kishon Valley where he killed them. And everyone felt justified, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! All right. I'm going to end there for today. Uh, next time we get back together, I'll probably have a guest on to discuss the Punic Wars in some detail. Uh, we're looking at some primary texts and some interesting statistics, and hopefully this information I've given you today can help color uh, that later discussion. For anyone writing to me in the immediate future, uh, I just got surgery on my hand and then I'm away for a week on vacation, so I can't really type anything extensive and I won't have access to a computer. So I'll just hold off to answering for a while uh, until it's not a pain. With that said, you've been listening to Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, and I'm Dan Attrell.